So we've, we've talked a lot about systemic treatments, tremendously exciting, but I don't want to ignore the fact that there are other approaches. Um, often these patients have bulky liver metastasis. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked a little bit about doing hepatic resection, but there are clearly other ways of treating liver metastasis. Um, embolization is one. I wanted to turn to, to Rod and Phil, perhaps, to tell us a little bit about embolization and how you might select a patient. What are the options there? Well, the, um, as I stated earlier, we really don't want to move into those therapies until we really know they're not surgical candidates. And as Phil described earlier, our idea that embolizing people is a sort of new adjuvant therapy to make uh, the surgery easier uh, was better. Um, a question that comes up a lot is how, how would an embolic therapy compare for, you know, to surgical therapy? And it, it's a lot of apples and oranges, but that uh, one meta-analysis that I described, they really did get in control fairly well for factors. And they said that, you know, for, for disease where you could debulk by about 70%, surgery seemed to be better, unless, of course, the patient is, is not a surgical candidate outright. And that then when you get up above that and, and as you move into the non-functional disease, um, you, you're, you can go more toward the liver-directed therapies. We have three different options. Bland embolization, in which we just occlude the hepatic arteries. Chemoembolization, in which it's laced with various cocktails, you know, none of which particularly make any sense of, you know, mitomycin C and things like that that, that have just always been put in these cocktails. <laughs> yeah. um, so just that's because. What they, just because, right? Just because. That's what they've done. Uh, and now radioembolization, where we're using microspheres, either glass or resin that will get down to the capillary level and then occlude. And then uh, uh, yttrium-90 is a beta emitter uh, with a half-life of about 64 hours, and it emits high-energy electrons for a very short distance. So actually the radiation hardly leaves the, the skin um, with this. So. Um, there's, there really aren't any compelling data that chemoembolization is better than bland embolization. And when it comes to toxicity, um, they are equal. Um, we, we know from a lot of work done by Mike Sulin at UPenn is that the, the toxicity comes from the embolization, not the chemo. And it seems if your gallbladder gets embolized, um, that will really make you very, very ill for quite some time. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's another plea that, you know, if we get their gallbladders out because if later on they move to embolic therapy, having that gallbladder gone will help them get yeah. through that. Um, of course, when you embolize the arteries, you may be pruning the tree and you may get a complete shutdown of the vascular system, which means it's not gonna be accessible again. Um, whereas the radioembolizations, those are repeatable. They are not occlusive. And patients can have two, perhaps even three uh, different cycles of that spaced a few years apart getting responses. The response, we, I don't think we, ha we know a lot about it yet. It, like, the, are the responses going to be um, as long lived in the second and third round as they were on the first? Perhaps not. Perhaps it will go in a more of a, of a rapid staccato type fashion. Um, but certainly, we can do radioembolizations for a few times and then come back to chemoembolization. So try to put, put them in that order that way. So I, I, actually, I, wanted to, I wanted to turn to Phil at, at your institution. Uh, where do you fit embolization in? Um, how do you decide between embolization or debulking surgery, for example? So that's um, a lot of questions rolled into one. And um, in general, if we're approaching, say we're talking now about liver that's burdened with tumor, general rules of the road are if less than 50% of the hepatic parenchyma is involved with tumor, 50% or less is tumor, and the rest is good liver that we can protect, because it's like real estate. Location, location, location. It's not only how much tumor is in the liver, but where in the liver. Can you get to it safely without hurting major bile ducts, hepatic arteries, portal veins, right at the confluence at the hilum and things like that, and jeopardize the good liver you're trying to preserve? So more than 50% of the liver is involved with tumor we're less likely to think of surgery for this patient as a really good candidate, except in the case of functional tumors where we can't get them under control any other way. And if we think we can get away with a debulking for hormonal control and they are nutritionally sound, they don't have carcinoid heart disease yet, 
They don't have a bunch of other comorbidities. I mean, so that, it's a small club that may, may qualify. These tumors in the hilum typically encase but don't invade, just like in the mesentery. And so at first pass on cross-sectional, I mean, it looks like, oh, man, this is in a really awful place. It's right sitting in the bifurcation of the hepatic artery, the portal vein, and the bile duct right there. Mm -hmm. And in, in other types of malignancies of adenocarcinoma of any kind, that's not a resectable lesion. But with this disease, many times it is. And the liver looks really funny when you're done because you've got two halves of the liver and a big hole in the middle. And you see daylight and you're looking down on the vena cava. But now you have resected their visible disease and it's gone. Um, we will use surgery as an adjunct. If we know we're going to leave liver disease behind, we'll use it as an adjunct for either chemoembolization or radioactive microspheres. We were leaning more towards microspheres initially for the reasons Rod mentioned in that it leaves the artery. You have a highway to the tumors. You take advantage of the fact that these tumors are supplied primarily by the artery. So you use that artery to get to the tumors to deliver whatever you want to deliver. Bland immunization, chemo immunization, or radioactive microparticles. What we're seeing now that we're getting better at keeping these patients alive longer, we're seeing patients that are now dying of radiation-induced cirrhosis. Uh, we, and it's I, a we've worrisome seen that too. finding. And so I must say we're probably getting away from radioembolization now, whereas before we used it a lot. Now we're being a little more circumspect, circumspect about who we're using it in, when we're using it. What we weren't doing was dosimetry, so we don't really know how much radiation the liver was getting. So we're also being super selective in fractionally embolizing the liver rather than blasting it. And the other thing we, in terms of chemoembolization versus bland embolization, I can't give you the rationale or the rhyme or reason, but in general, the older, more frail patients are more likely to get bland embolization, and the younger patients that are more vigorous and probably would hope have a longer lifespan ahead of them, we tend to use chemoembolization and hit them pretty hard. And I don't know if that's the right answer or not, but that's what we do. Fair enough. It's, I mean, it's fascinating because we use bland, mm -hmm. and then we use bland. And then we'll use bland. <laughs> and then maybe we'll use radioembolization. I mean, right. we, but for it, but all the reasons you discussed. 50% of the discussed, time, the arteries are going to be gone yeah. with repeated yeah. embolizations. Well, no, but, uh, you know, it depends on how, how frequently they, you do it, right? I mean, we, we're pretty... But they pretty do recanalize, you're right. So you can use it. It's not can. a... It doesn't always kill the artery forever. Not always. It can recanalize. No, I mean, we, you know, we're also very selective in how frequently we're going to do it, right? So if a patient has already disease progression at three months, you know, mm -hmm. embolization is not what should be, I, I believe, right. should be happening. But, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm really worried about the Chemoembolization, the biliary sclerosis that can mm -hmm. happen from these without any great data to suggest that it's better. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, what you just said is so powerful about the radioembolization yeah. and the risks of liver uh, failure from non cancer related problems. I mean, our patients mm -hmm. can live for years. And I, I think I'm very concerned about the use of radioembolization and how much more frequently it's going on. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in you, our patient population, we need to have better data before I think yeah. this comes readily yeah. available. And then if you roll PRRT into it, which exactly. provides more data, we, we're now right. seeing really big yeah, quantities liver failure. of how, do yeah. we, how much radiation is this liver going to get? So, Rod, you, you mentioned PRT. This is something that uh, has been widely used in Europe, but probably less commonly used here in North America. What is PRT for those people who don't know our acronyms? Well. PRT stands for peptide receptor radiotherapy. So this uh, harks back to the Octrio scan, or in more modern times, the Gallium 68 scan, in which we can actually image uh, the somatostatin receptor presence on the tumor. So we take a radio-labeled somatostatin analog. Um, this is generally done for the, for the case of an Octrio scan. It's indium-111. And with a gallium 68 scan, obviously it's gallium 68. But these are light bulbs that we're attaching to the hormone so that it, when it sticks to the tumor and we image them, we can see a glow where the tumor is. But it's, it's, it's not uh, radioactivity that really would be cytotoxic. Um, so with PRRT, either lutetium-177 or yttrium-90 is attached. So we're now using the hormone to smuggle atomic bombs to the cells for us <laughs> uh, as, as little nuclear terrorists. And um, the idea is that it's, it's a bit of a magic bullet. It goes to the tumors and radiates in very short distances, uh, leaving essentially the rest of the body that doesn't really have somatostatin receptors in high density uh, unaffected. Uh, it's given intravenously. Um, it's, it's very quick. Um, generally, patients uh, get it in a matter of minutes, and they're monitored for only a matter of days. And uh, 
it can then be repeated about six weeks later. They get an amino acid infusion because uh, octreotide is essentially amino acids and or short amino acids. So the kidney recognizes it as amino acid and says that shouldn't go through the urine. It needs to go back in the blood system. So the radioactivity can keep going around and around in the kidneys. So to confound that, we give them a high uh, concentration and intravenous infusion of cold amino acids so the kidneys are so busy pumping that out that the ac radioactive octreotide goes right on through and it, it's protective to the kidneys. So um, there are a number of centers in Europe that have it. Uh, we had a trial here in the United States uh, comparing it to high dose octreotide of 60 milligrams. So when patients wanted it and they said I want to go on the trial, I said well you really won't get to necessarily get the treatment, you're going to be randomized and you might just get high dose octreotide. But the study is full, uh, it's done and we're waiting for the results. So I really liked your atomic bomb I know, I like, I like that too, I'm going to have <laughs> um, to use that one. It, it, and it does, I, we, we've sent a few people over to Europe and also participated in that study and, and you do see this approach work, it's, it's very exciting. It is. Uh, but one, one question is the, uh, the long term radiation effects uh, and sometimes you do see thrombocytopenia and other effects, I don't know, Diane, you've sent a few patients over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, um, certainly in my experience, the more treated the patient is, the higher the risk that the bone marrow suppression is going to be a problem. Um, but you know, the risk is probably on the order of about 2% again of MDS and leukemia with this radiation to the bone marrow. So um, I think it's very promising. Um, I think the number that people use is about 30% of the patients can get some benefit from this with a good response. Um, and at least right now, sending someone over to Europe with a 30% chance of response is ethically very challenging too. So I think it's certainly still experimental, but something that we're all very excited yeah. to uh, hear in terms of the NETR results. So I guess, yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, to that point, there's one thing, uh, one word of caution about PRRT that, that also has been a worrisome thing. And that's again, liver failure. And I think it's because we treat patients differently here than in Europe, whereas they tend to use pre RRT yeah, earlier in that's their course right. of therapy. And it, it looks like from their reports that you can see control that lasts about two to three years. Yeah. In this country, we give them embolizations of all kinds, bland and chemo, then they get radioactive microspheres, then they get some round of something else, and maybe another round of microspheres, and nothing. And that's all failing. So then they go to Europe for PRRT, and those people come back with radiation induced cirrhosis. But a lot of those patients for two to three years were actually non-progressing. You know, they didn't have to have disease progression. Uh, a lot of those patients that get disease control for two to three years. So You're how about much the European patients? The yeah. European yeah. patients. Yeah. So how much of that is biology right. versus? Yeah. Right. And I think you're right. I think that you know because we have this ethical issue of we don't have it here, right. it may not be covered. So you know it's we have other options for these exactly. So you know but, we well, want and to. We don't know the long term side. Effects. We need to be no. cautious about the additive because. In, in neither case is dosimetry being done. The PRT or radioactive microspheres, Y9, yttrium 90 spheres. And so I think the liver takes a big hit from that. Mm -hmm. um, and now having said all that, we're about to start PRT as therapy in our program because Louisiana just passed a right to try law. There's about a dozen states now that have a right to try in the case of, of advanced cancer malignancy you have the right to try any therapy and you do not have to wait on FDA approval as a state law. So we'll see where this all gets in there. Oh, yeah. It's Love kind of that. working its way through some levels of atomic people and safety people and radiation people and the legal eagles, but I suspect we will probably be getting away from radioactive microspheres and leaning more towards PRT, especially in the patients yeah. that have you know, widespread you know, metastases outside the liver, as well as maybe liver-directed PRT arterially right into the liver, which not a lot of people are talking about yet. 